The title of today's message is Takers. Marlo Thomas said, my father said, there were two kinds of people in the world, givers and takers. The takers may eat better, but the givers sleep better. Thought that was interesting. Uh, the most extreme version of a taker is a thief. Um, and I don't know that this gets addressed enough in church because uh, we think, well, no, Christians steal. Okay, so, you know. Um, but if you go back to Exodus twenty fifteen, simple little verse, you shall not steal. So uh, I've talked to guys in the military. One guy in particular said, well, we didn't call it stealing in the military. We called it acquiring like you would see something that wasn't yours and you would acquire that for yourself. Uh, acquires for singing, it is not for taking what's not yours. Um, so then Ephesians, we're gonna jump around a little bit today, but go to Ephesians chapter 4, 28. <clears throat> and this indicates that there are Christians still stealing. Um, I may or may not have ever told this story uh, when I was a kid, I had to have been probably 10, 11, something years old. There's a big mall in Brazil where I grew up. We went in the mall, and I got in this store, and I saw some, like, rollerball pins or something. I'm like, man, these are tremendous, but they're expensive. And, you know, you just get in that moment, you're a kid, and, like, they're right there, and I could take these, and... So somehow I managed to grab some of those pins and put them in my pocket. And then I got outside the store and went, oh my gosh, what have I done? I've just stolen. Now I got to figure out how to get them back in there without getting caught. So now I'm sneaking back in the store trying to put them back because I felt so terrible. Um, everybody deals with something different. Some people their challenge is lying. Some people their challenge is um, gossip, sex, drugs, alcohol, whatever it is. But for some people, it's just stealing. They just can't, they just can no more not take something they see that they want. Um, they just take it. I still am not sure about this. And uh, for over 30 something years, I've had a pair of sunglasses and I've managed not to lose them or break them. And I put them in my car. They're in a certain spot in my car. And I opened that little spot up the other day and my glasses are not in there now. Either I, has all, I have Alzheimer's and I've misplaced them, or I valet park somewhere or something, and someone got those glasses and took them. Now you say, well, what are you going to do? I'm going to pray for that person, right? Because you start getting really upset. You say, well, you know, people have plenty. And if you talk to people that in big box stores, Walmart, all these big stores, they just allow for a certain number of dollars being lost every year. Uh, loss prevention departments, they just, it, people are going to steal. It's just kind of like the way it is. Uh, don't be this person, right? And you think, well, nobody really cares, and these companies have so much, they're never going to miss it. Let me tell you what you're going to miss. You're asleep. What you're going to miss is knowing that's not mine. Uh, what am I doing with this? And if you live that kind of life and you're a believer, especially you're a Christian and then someone goes, dude, what are you doing? And they think, well, if that's what being a Christian is, I don't need to be a Christian. I'm not even a thief. And this guy says he's a Christian and he's stealing the company blind. Look at this one in Ephesians chapter 4, 28. Let him who stole steal no longer. So clearly he's writing, Paul's writing this church at Ephesus, and there are people who used to steal. He says, don't steal anymore. But rather, let him labor, working with his hands what, what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need, people who only take uh, there are people who only take but don't give out there. So interesting how this rolls together. Let him rather work, labor, working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give to him who has need. This is not always the case, but thieves are usually greedy and don't share anything with anybody. Um, when you work with your own hands, when you produce something, uh, and then you have an opportunity to give to somebody, it means something. So you say, well, I'm a, yeah, I steal, but I, I share what I steal. And what kind of sacrifice is that? 
You didn't do anything to get it. You stole it, so you're just sharing what's not yours anyway. Big deal. I always loved it in our house where the girls would want something, and if they had their own money, you'd kind of say, well, do you want it enough to buy it with your own money? No. Right? I want it if you're going to buy it, but I don't want it if i got to buy it. Right? Because if you work for something and you have something you've saved, you're not letting it go that easily because you start adding it up. So many hours means so many dollars, and no, I can live without this. So simply put, don't steal. Now let me give you the bad news of this, if, if stealing is not bad enough. Unless a person is walking with God, you say, I'm a Christian, so that means I won't steal anymore. That's not true. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you walk in the flesh, you will fulfill the lust of the flesh. So a believer who does not walk with God is not lined up his will, his way, you are going to default to whoever you were. And you say, well, that's true because I'm a Christian. I'm so frustrated because I've gone back to stealing or whatever your thing is. How is that? Because if you don't walk with God and stay close to him, you're going to go back to whatever you had. Anybody experience that along the way? I'm not saying today, of course, because there's no sinners here, but along the way. Um, okay. So am I saying don't steal? Yes. But what are you going to have to do to accomplish that? You're going to have to get really tight, really close to him and say, Lord, there's no way I'm not going to be this person unless you take over my life and you're not just the savior of my life, you're the Lord of my life. And you give me the power to resist this and say, I'm not going there anymore. Okay. A taker, urban dictionary. I don't always use a lot of urban dictionary <laughs> definitions because just it can be tricky. A taker in the Urban Dictionary is one who is always taking from others, similar to a mooch or chiseler. In most cases, takers aren't stealing. They are just taking advantage of the hospitality of others without reciprocating or saying thanks. That's a taker. Turn to Job chapter 2. Now you say, well, people say, well, where do these messages come from? So when I, I spend a lot of time, most of my week is spent with people, sitting down with people. And you lay out, as I will, some of these scriptures today, and you tell people, okay, you want your life to change. And so you explain to them uh, what it's going to take for that change to happen. And they kind of look at you. And as it turns out, there's not many takers. But as it turns out on the other end, that's almost all there are is takers. Uh, I'm not going to read you the whole story of Job, but God brings Job up in some meeting somewhere in the heavenlies. And you know, I keep saying this over and over, you know, Lord, please do not bring me up in these meetings. Right. Uh, you may like me, don't like me that much. Don't bring me up in these meetings. And he says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And then all hell breaks loose on Job, literally, and his livestock, every, you know, barns fall in. He loses all of his children and just boom, 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 just catastrophe. And then you find out why God picked Job. His health is taken away from him, but God says you can't kill him. And he's down to himself and his wife, and look at Job 2.10. So she's saying basically curse God and die. Like, what's wrong with you? This is a nightmare. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Kind of, you got you to gotta have some something, something there just to even get that first phrase out. Um, you got to be leading in your house to say that. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I am not going to say these things. Um, now, you say, well, you know, it gets tough out here. It's, it's hard. Things happen. And I can't, I can't do this anymore. I, and what do we literally say? I can't take this anymore. So we're, a lot of us are takers. We want the blessings of God, and I'll read you about that in a minute. So we want God to keep it coming. But then when something swings the other direction, we say, whoa, 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 I can't take this anymore. Like, what are you doing? You're supposed to love me. You're supposed to care for me. You're supposed to be kind to me, merciful, and bless me. What is all this mess? 
And Job sums it up. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? Okay? So you say, well, I'm in an adversity situation. You can take it. You say, well, how do you know that? Because I got scripture that says he will never hit you with more than you can what? Take. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. So you're not going to be hit with any temptation or any situation that with him you can, you can weather the storm. You say, well, how do you know that? Because what kind of God would he be if that weren't the case? You say, but I can't carry this. No, you can't carry it alone. That's what you can't do. You say, well, but I don't want to talk to God about it. I'm angry at God. Well, then try to carry it by yourself. You're going nowhere. You're going absolutely nowhere. And then when you finally yield and say, okay, Lord, I trust you. I thank you. I don't know how we're going to do this. I can't take it by myself. But I know you can take us wherever you need to take us. So here we go. And you'd be amazed what you can survive. More than survive. Okay? Matthew 7. Now, I don't say this, what I'm about to read you, I do not say, and I'm not reading this in a discouraging way. I'm just telling you this is what the scripture says, and this is just a fact. And this is part of what is so challenging about continuing to, to push and to say to people, look, you've got to keep moving. You've got to keep growing. There's more to this life than just being a ticket holder. He's got more, right? But what does Jesus say? 7.13, Matthew 7.13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. That leads to destruction. Wide open, here we go. He says, don't take that way. Take the narrow gate. Verse 14, because narrow is the gate. He uses that, goes back to that again. Narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And then the last phrase, and there are few who find it. The broad way, easy to find. The straight gate, now you say, well, I made it through the straight gate. Jesus is the way. You know, I get it. I made it through the gate. Baby, you got through the gate, now you got to stay on the way. You got to stay out of the way to stay on the way. So we think, well, I found, the, I found the Jesus gate and I got through the gate and we're all good. And he says, no, I'm not just the gate. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I'm everything you need. You got to stay connected to me. And what is it, how does it turn out? There are few there be that find it. It doesn't say nobody finds it. But what are you looking for? I'm looking for ease. I'm looking for pleasure. I'm looking for fun. I want God to take care of me. But if he comes to me and asks me for something, I'm out. He can't require anything of me. I thought it was all mercy and grace and free. Free, 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 free. Some commercial about that out there. Matthew 19. Now, this guy in Matthew 19 is not a bad person, okay? So this is like a whole, this is next level kind of nuanced conversation with someone that Jesus has. Matthew 19, verse 16. Now, behold, one came to, and said to him, good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? Everybody wants to do something uh, to make it to heaven. Um, you, can't, you can't do anything, right? This, it's, a, it's a gift. What needed to be done was done by Jesus. Now what you got to do is believe and receive. You say, well, I want to participate. That's how you participate. You got nothing. I got nothing. I have nothing to offer to the equation. And even the faith that I have, the scripture talks about, he gives me the faith. So I have literally nothing. Um, but we come in. Now, this guy was kind of setting Jesus up a little bit. What, what do I got to do? Well, whatever Jesus comes back with, I've already done all that. I'm in. I'm good. Verse 17, so he said to him, why do you call me good? 
didn't even get into the answer to the question. First of all, you called me good. Why'd you call me good? None, no one is good but, but one, that is God. So sets him up, sets him straight there. You want to figure out how to be good, or you're thinking I'm good, only God's good, I am God. Didn't say it right here, but uh, if you think you're good because of what you're doing, that's not what makes you good. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, Whew. it's not in the original, but Whew. all these things I've kept from my youth. So anything else? What do I still lack? I got all that. Now, be careful. You think, I think, I'm all set. Jesus doesn't want any more. I'm there. I gave my life to Jesus. I'm following Jesus. I'm obeying Jesus. I'm doing the whole deal. And then Jesus, you keep asking him questions. He says, okay, well, how about this? He, and the guy said, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, okay, well, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. That's all. Now you would think the guy go, okay, I came asking you questions and I wanted answers and I got my answer, so I'll be right back. I'm going to have a big liquidation and give it to the poor and don't leave, I'll be right back. But what happens? But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. I don't think he had great possessions. I think great possessions had him. Now, I will, I will throw this out. Um, back to Job. Of all, it seems, it appears that of all the people on the planet at that time, God picks Job and says, have you considered my servant Job? He's the man. And Job proved to be just that. Um, you don't get picked by God as a Job unless you have a relationship with him. Okay? So, uh, I almost don't want to say this out loud because it may cause you to go backwards even more. If you keep walking with Jesus, he might pick you. You say, well, what do you mean? He might pick you for some suffering. Everybody wants to know him and the power of his resurrection, but not the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. So we kind of check out, and we're takers, 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 and then we go, I'm out. I'm not a taker on this. So how far do you want to go? Uh, you ask a single guy who's hot after a girl, and the answer would be all the way. Right? Not interested in any bases. We're not playing baseball. All the way. What would happen if our passion for him kicked into an all the way category? And no matter what he offered, I'm a taker. I'm in, whatever it costs. Every once in a while I think about that rich young ruler, the guy that came to him and walked away sorrowful. You say, well, what would have happened to him if he had followed Jesus? It would have been a lot better than what happened to him by not doing so. Because then you wake up and go, I traded Jesus for this, for this pile of whatever. And see, what you don't know is Jesus, that just might have been a test for him at that moment, and he would have followed Jesus, and Jesus said, good for you, good job. Now go back into business. Now that those things don't have you, I have you. Maybe he would have been rich again, but maybe his perspective would have changed and he would have been holding on to just a taker. He, would have turned, he could have turned into a giver, right? So people think, well, if I, if, I, if I yield, if I give my life completely over to Jesus, not just Savior, but boss, Lord of my life, he's going to jack my life up. You know what? You don't need his help for that. Look at you. 
Talk to anybody. I meet people that are just, just stiff-necked, stiff-armed, you know, nothing. I don't want anything to do with it. And if you, if you just follow around and watch them, what a mess. I saw a guy a few days ago that I've known over 20 years, and I met him. And when I met him, uh, he was successful at the time. Big, tall, good-looking guy. And he had, he, he had it then, then he built a $750 million company. And I don't see him very often, but I saw him at lunch the other day. And I gave him a big hug, and I said, hey, what's going on? And he said, man, we need to get together. So we text each other, and I would, I would read you his text, but this is kind of what he said. As it turns out, you were right about the money. But there are worse things to deal with than that. So he, he held on. You say, but you tried. I'm trying with you. I'm trying with me. Right? Uh, and, and we lose people over this. Grow longer nails, scratch more ears. People come back. Oh, I can listen to that. I can take that. Because he's not meddling. He just told some nice stories and read some scripture about God loving me and blessing me. But he didn't go, you know, colonoscopy digging around anywhere, right? He's, he's not up in my stuff. Because even if I am dying, I don't want to know about it. Because I'm good. I'm just going to keep taking. And how is that working out for you? And how is that going to work out for you? It's not. So you say, okay, well then if I sign up, I could suffer. You're suffering already. The book says you're going to suffer no matter what. That's just part of the package of being alive. But it is better for suffer, to suffer for doing right, good, than evil. Not many takers. Luke 9, 23. Now these are the verses. And people memorize them and underline them and can quote them, blah, 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 blah. This is the stuff. So Jesus came along and said, I can save you. I can save you. You got to trust me completely. Um, quick story. An Ethiopian man showed up in my office the other day with some white dude that he, it turns out, uh, it's, let me tell what's the what's the short version of this. This Ethiopian church in Garland had done an outreach. They got out, they got outreaching, and this Ethiopian Christian met this white dude and didn't have anywhere to take him because the Ethiopian church service was in Ethiopian. The youth service was had some English. He didn't know where to take him. So he starts calling people on the radio that he listens to and couldn't get to some of them. And he called, made an appointment, and I met with him. So he sits down, there we are, and I explain the gospel to this white dude, 40-something years old, been sober for six years, you know, intense life, and um, share the gospel with him. The three of us sitting there, he prays and becomes a Christian. Um, so you say, then he's all good. Yeah, he's going to heaven. But what if you don't die? Right? Right? Now, if you just got your ticket, boom, and you're dead, then what is all these verses about? There's a chance you might live, and clearly you are, because you're still listening. So now what? Ticket holder is nice. It's the beginning. Born is nice. It's the beginning. Growing, maturing, doing the deal. So you say, oh, I don't even hear these verses. Here it is, Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, you want to follow me? Okay, here's how you do it. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And that's where straight as gate, not many takers. I, I don't want to deny me. Uh, I joke around about, you know, Twizzlers and Red Vines and all this mess, you know. I, if I get me a tub of those Red Vines, whoo! they are gone, they are gone, they are gone, they are gone, right? Because you don't have to open any packages. You just pop a top and here we go. And even if the Holy Spirit says, we've had enough red vines for 10 minutes. 
My flesh says, oh, that's what you think. Right? So what's your deal? I mean, I got other deals. So you say, well, I can have a glass of wine or two or three or four or five. What is all that? Well, I got to feeling good and I don't want to deny myself. Right? So this, this is where it gets tricky. You ask somebody if they're a Christian, they can answer that question. Ask them this. Are you a follower of Jesus? You say, well, is there a difference? You can be a Christian without being a follower of Christ. You can't be a follower of Christ without being a Christian. And it's going to take you somewhere else. Because if you're following Jesus, you're going where he's going. And he says, hey, Richard, we're going over here. We're going to talk to these people. I go, maybe you are, but I'm not. And guess what? You're riding. This is my body. This is my mouth. And we're not talking to these people. If you break it down that way, that sounds pretty crazy. But we take control back because we don't like what he wants to do. We don't want to deny ourselves. We don't want any suffering. And so I'm out. Not many takers. Now, I will tell you, every day of my life is not lived this way 24-7. I got moments still. I am trying to minimize the moments more and more and more. Because even with some suffering along the way, my, my life is so much better his way than it could ever be my way. I want more of his way. Even if it costs me something, it's better his way. Because you see things you would never see unless you followed him. And if you check out and say, I'm out, <coughs> you're not there. If you like those, <laughs> here's some more. Luke 17. Pretty sad story, actually. Um, you don't want to be you don't want to be this. Luke 17, 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem, they passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. We need you. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priest. And so it was as they went, they were cleansed. And I'm not getting off on this today. But if Jesus tells you to do something, you say, well, I asked for something, he didn't do it. If he told you to go do something, sometimes what you've asked him for happens while you're going, while you're doing it. Not sitting there going, well, I'm not doing anything until he answers my prayer. Right? So he tells you to do something, he shows up while you're doing it. So they go show themselves the priests, uh, and they were cleansed on the way. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice glorifying God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? There were 10 of you guys, weren't there? But where are the nine? And by the way, look at what he says about the 10. How did he know they were cleansed? They're not there. And it happened on the way. They left him. Because he did it. So he knows they got what they asked for. Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? So not even the Jewish guys that were there from the lo local guys. It's a Samaritan. And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. The, the other guy's faith made them well too. Take, 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 take. Why don't you take some time to tell him thank you? Right? Um, I mentioned this the other day in regard to my wife about praising her. Right? Uh, so if I was going to praise someone, who needs some praise? Kenny. So here's Kenny over here. He's our drummer. So I've known Kenny a very long time. Kenny is one of the best pocket drummers you're ever going to meet. Right? He can go. And he's up here playing the drums. You think, oh, he's just a hired gun up here playing the drums. He is worshiping with two sticks, two feet, 
right? He's worshiping. He's a great man, bumps in the road. I pick Kenny. Now, what did I just do? I just praised Kenny. I didn't ask him for anything, right? So when's the last time I went to God and said, hey, I don't need anything. You just, you're, you're something. You're amazing. Because look at me. I got feet, I got hands, I can walk, I can talk, I'm healthy. I got food, I got clothing, I got way more than all that stuff. You're amazing. I thank you. I praise you. You're amazing. You think, well, God didn't need that. That's why he made us. And it's amazing if you praise him. Still fascinated, Patrick and I have these conversations. All the people come dragging their you-know-what's in here after the music's over for the sermon. I hate to tell you this, but you reveal so much about yourself when you do that, you have no idea. Oh, I just, I just come for the word, the word. I don't need all that worship that you're going to do forever in heaven without the word. I don't like that music. You say, oh, now you're meddling, you're pushing. Maybe it's time. Well, I just, you know, that's just my, I like that part. Mature people don't pick parts. They show up for the package. I don't want to get the COVID. So you're magically immune to the COVID if you just come for the word, but not the worship. It doesn't make any sense. Now, it doesn't make perfect sense if you're a newborn Christian. Okay. And then somebody said, well, now you're, you've embarrassed me. No, you embarrassed yourself. <laughs> Not many takers. John chapter 6, just when you thought there were no more verses. So Jesus has fed uh, thousands of people with some, you know, a lunch. And these people are like, oh, my gosh, we got the guy. Like, we don't, you need to stay, listen to the word, and he's going to feed us. And this is amazing. So John 6, 22, on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So they're, they're after him. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? How'd you get here? We didn't see you get a boat. Uh, Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, and, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You don't, you don't want me because of anything else but the food. You're just here for more food, more miracle food. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. So he's got people following him around for the food. You know what? They don't last. And if you keep reading this chapter, he starts really teaching. And it says, I think down in verse 666, from, the, from this time many of the disciples ceased to follow after him. And I've always thought it very interesting that John 6, 66 is that. And he looks at the 12 and he says, are you out too? Will you also leave me? And what did Peter pipes up and says what? Where do we go? Where are we going to go? Because we believe that you're the Christ. 
the Son of the living God. To whom shall we go? So, everybody, you know, if, you, if, you, if you tuned out out there somewhere, they're gone anyway. If you've tuned out, you just didn't get up and walk out, you can leave. But where are you going to go? You say, well, I'll find me another church that will do what? That will do what? Well, they're going to be nicer to me. They're not going to expect all this from me. It's not me. I'm reading you scripture that works. Go find you somebody who tells you what you want to hear and see how that works for you. And then get to the end of your life and go, ooh, I just burned up 20, 30, 40 years and I got nothing to show for it because I did what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. I was a taker, but I wasn't a taker. Acts 20. Um, verse 35. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So if you decide you're going to be not just a taker, but you're Okay, I'm in. I'm a taker. I'll sign up. As you mature, as you grow, it starts to shift. And all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, I got so much abundance. I got so much overflow. I got so much more than I need. It shifts from taking in to passing things on. Um, if you, it, this is, if you've never heard this, this is extraordinary. If you go in the, in the book of maps, it's usually in the back of your uh, Bible, if you got a fancy Bible, you got maps. Um, in, the, in, the, in the back of your Bible, there may be a maps. And if you look at a map of Israel, the River Jordan flows from the north to the south. And it gets to the Sea of Galilee. And it dumps into the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is just a big lake. They call it a sea. It's a big lake, beautiful lake. Sea of Galilee, the water flows in there. Then it flows out of the Sea of Galilee in the south, the bottom edge. And continues, and guess where it goes? To the Dead Sea. So a few miles north, you got Sea of Galilee, vibrant, fishing, sailing, just life. And a few miles to the south, all that water dumped into the Dead Sea. And why is it called the Dead Sea? Because it is dead. If you get in there, you literally can't sink. You float. You just sit there. There's so much salt in the water, you just float. If you shaved and cut yourself, you'll pay. It's not a, not a good, you know. It's dead. Death, death, death. Why is that the case? And it's literally in the geography of Israel that if life flows in and then through and out, you have life. If life flows through and to but not out, you have death. So you say, well, what's wrong with my life? I don't know. See if anything's going out. Are you just a taker? Sooner or later, takers that get in on Jesus' real deal get so full they overflow, and all of a sudden, they are givers. Um, what's, good, what's God going to have to give you before you got enough and where you got enough to give something away? Two-year-olds. Mine. Go in, a, go in a room with a two-year-old playing with toys and try to take one of a thousand of their toys. That's mine. Mine. Let them grow up a little bit, and they've been taught to share. Oh, here. They'll, they'll hand another kid a toy. You can't play with one toy at a time. Maybe two. You got cars racing each other, but, I mean, that's it. Um, trying to decide having a conversation here about whether the dosage is too strong already. Okay, go one more. First Timothy six. Let me talk about garage sales really quick before we read this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a thought, 
pre-garage sale. Walk through your house and all your junk and all the stuff you're about to sell for a dollar, right? I'm going to get a, will you take a dollar for that? Like, okay. You can spend all that time and effort. Walk through your house and say, Lord, should I just give all this away? Well, I could make 600 bucks. What if you could bless a bunch of people way more than getting 600 bucks? People have nothing. Well, I got extra this, extra that. Some people got, they, they don't have extra. So you start asking around, hey, you know anybody? Every once in a while we have a homeless person in a shelter. They get a place to live. And, then, and they say, I got nothing. And you know what? People respond. People with a brain respond. Now here's how you know you're in trouble. <laughs> Well, she seems real nice. He seems real nice. But my stuff is probably too nice for some homeless person's first apartment. Really? I could get more because, you know, we, don't be needing, we probably don't need to give fine things. What's Jesus been doing to you all these years? Throwing you bones? Blessing, blessing, blessing. Not just food and clothing, abundance. And then we hold out on him. And we wonder why people don't even know we're his kids. Your daddy doesn't act this way. I don't know who you are, but you say he's your daddy, but that's not your daddy. Okay, 1 Timothy 6, verse uh, 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and, and perdition. I don't want anything to do with all that. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the, from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And then he says, But you, O man, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, peace, gentleness. Uh, go down to verse 17. He circles back around. Command those who are rich in this present age. So, and by the way, you say, Well, you're dogging rich people. The Bible doesn't dog rich people. The Bible goes after people who have a love of money. It does not say money is the root of all kinds of evil. It says the love of money. You got a love of money. You cannot worship God and mammon. You got to pick a lane. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. So that's how a rich person ought to operate. You're ready. Ready. I'm ready. Okay, Lord, where we, who are we giving to next? Right? If I picked five random people in here and I said, I'm going to give each of you $10,000 in your job, you can't spend any of that money. You got to give it away this week. You got to pray about it and give it away. You'd either have a blast or every time you handed a bill out, you go, oh my gosh, what could I do with this money? You know what? It ain't your money. So you couldn't do anything with it. Don't go spending God's money. That doesn't go well. If I left anybody out, I just feel terrible. I hate leaving people out. Um, <laughs> let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. You know, Americans are so competitive. You hear a need. I got that. Wait, wait, no, I can help. No, no, I said it first. I got it. I got it. That's mine. We ought to be fighting to try to help people. Be first in that. I can meet that need. We got one of those. <laughs> we got two of those. We got three of those. 
Okay, just a couple more and then we're done. Acts chapter 2. Um, so let's go back to the beginning of the process. Let's say you've jacked your whole life up. Maybe you're not a bad person. Maybe you've done some stupid things, but somehow God has come to you and um, you, you just know I'm in trouble. I'm empty. It's not working. I'm chasing people, things, places. I just think everything else is going to fix it. And no matter where I go, how much I make, all this, it doesn't work. I'm empty. And you say, okay, God, I need you. And he gives you faith. Here's what it sounds like from Scripture when you get to that place. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost came. This is when the Holy Spirit shows up. In verse 36, um, Peter's preached this amazing sermon. And he says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's the boss. He's the Messiah. He's the guy. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I'm a taker. I'm in. That's who I need. Um, no matter how many times I, I see somebody get saved, I'm telling you, it, will, it still messes me up because I realize I have no power except the, the power of the gospel. I cannot save anyone. I cannot talk them into it. I cannot convince them. I'm not eloquent enough. There's no fancy story, emotional story. Nobody gets saved unless Jesus saves them. But if you hear his voice, if today you hear his voice, do not harden your heart because it's not going to get better. You may have challenges by choosing him, but it will not get better without him, without him in this life or in the hereafter. Because when you pick Jesus, you go from serving an undertaker to serving a caretaker. Because the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. You got to pick a plan. And these people heard the gospel. And what do they say? What do we do? Go to one more, Acts 16. And this is a story about Paul and Silas in prison, singing at midnight. The jail's busted wide open. And the, and the keeper of the prison thinks everybody's escaped. Uh, verse 27, the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, so this whole experience caused what to happen to the jailer? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I'm in. I'm a taker. I'm tired of taking and, and it not working. What do I do? So you say, okay, that was his question. What was, what was the answer? This is the answer. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took that them the same night, same hour of the night, washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Not because one man but believed, but because they all believed. Now, I don't know where you are. Um, I don't know in, in the process of all we've talked about. But let me talk a minute to somebody who doesn't know him personally. And you know it's not going to get better. And you know God is right there. And he's talking to you. He's trying to get your attention. He's you, people, you know people have prayed for you, talked to you about this. You cannot just say you believe there's a God. The demons in hell believe in that and tremble at his name. This is about believing and receiving and saying, yes, I'm a taker in the sense that you're offering eternal life free of charge, abundant life free of charge, I receive that. I'll take it. I want it personally. You say, well, how do I do that? Here's how. A simple prayer. 
And if you're in the room or beyond, pray this with me right now. God, I know that I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood to pay for my sins and to offer me eternal life as a free gift. I believe he died for me, was raised from the dead. I accept eternal life. I accept the forgiveness of my sins and I receive you into my physical body. I ask you to move in and take over my life not just a ticket holder for heaven, but a life between here and the hereafter. Thank you for loving me, for saving me, changing my heart, changing my destiny, my destination, my past, my everything, like being born a second time. Now that you live in me, I ask you to live through me in such a way that people who see me will see you. People who know me will know that I know you. And my life will reflect you, my Father, you, my Savior. And Father, for people that are Christians, and I'm sure I've been hit, Lord, we've all been hit by some verse, Holy Spirit working at us wherever we are, and I pray that we would not stiff arm you anymore if we've done that, that we would not get stiff necked, hard hearted, but that we would be malleable, that we would be shapeable still. And where we're wrong, that we would confess that and know that forgiveness is available and where there needs to be correction in our direction, that we would be open to that. Uh, thank you for being kind. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for being merciful. Thank you for being good in God and uh, that there's hope and help us see that hope today. You're the best. Um, it's all great to be down here and trying to figure it out and read the scriptures and know that you live in us and serve you and do all this, but there'll be nothing like being there with you. So as our, our prayer is even so, come Lord Jesus and help us long and live for the day when we are with you there and we take as many people with us as possible. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.